delighted that we have not just one speaker, but three today to squeeze into an hour. I met Noemi Etienne at a symposium last fall in Cambridge, England, and I was delighted when she let me know her plans to visit New York. I'm so glad we can take advantage of that opportunity because when we met, I thought, oh, here's someone who's got some exciting ideas. So let's try and run with this. Noemi received her doctorate jointly from the University of Paris Une, Panthéon Sorbonne. Uh, is that right? It's perfect. Good. <laughs> uh, and the University of Geneva, which I'm pronouncing in the English manner, in 2011. She's no stranger to New York, having been a postdoctoral fellow uh, at New York University in 2012, and then Mellon postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Fine Arts between 2013 and 2015. And the following year, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Getty Research Institute. She's currently a Swiss National Science Foundation professor at the University of Delft, with a guest position this winter at the Panthéon Sorbonne. Noemi published her first book, The Restoration of Paintings in Paris, 1750 to 1815, in French, in 2012, with this English translation published by the Getty uh, last year. Her second forthcoming book is on dioramas in New York around 1900, and she's also, she also co-founded Journal 18. I guess it's Journal 18. Mm, we, we kind of say Journal 18. Okay, Journal 18. <laughs> oh, my yeah. uh, A journal for 18th century art and material culture. Uh, she's currently leading a research project on exoticism in the Enlightenment that will result in an exhibition in Lausanne in 2020, which is like tomorrow. <laughs> it's on this topic that she and her collaborators, uh, Claire Brison and uh, Shania Lee uh, will address us today. So I hand it over to them, and I'm not sure how we're going to do this, but so Okay, Alain, do you hear me? How is it going? Do, you, I, do I need the mic? Is that yes. good? Yeah, I do need, okay. So I um, will mainly do the, the talking, and the first thing uh, I would like to say is to, the, to say thank you to you, Ivan, for having us. Uh, it has been a pleasure meeting you, and it's a pleasure to be here, a space that I visited actually a couple of times um, when I was um, working at the IFE uh, across the park. Just in short, my colleagues are completely uh, co-owners of the material and ideas that I'm going to present. I'm just going to talk uh, because we thought it would be easier to have one, one spokesperson, but um, this has no other function. And also just in short, basically, I'll, I'll tell you briefly what, what's going on. We uh, are trying to do an exhibition. We are, or I am no curator. Uh, my colleague Claire Brison has museum experience and it means that we are a little bit experimenting here, trying to make sense of that. And we will really present something that is ongoing, that is actually in progress, that has also weaknesses and strengths uh, that we will we'll be happy to discuss with you. And I would say even more so grateful to discuss with you because somehow we need, uh, for us, it's a really good occasion to present abroad, have like other perspective on the material uh, we are working on. And if you want to interrupt me at some point, guys, you, you can do it, of course, um, with great pleasure. So basically, what are we doing? What we are trying to do is an interdisciplinary show um, that's important for us, and it's based on one year for now of museum, storage, and archives research in the contemporary territory of Switzerland. So we really spent a lot of time on the spots. Um, and the idea or the topic or the way we would like to do it is to interrogate how or which place material culture played uh, in constructing otherness in 18th century Switzerland. This is basically the, the pitch of the show. Now we have three questions or hypotheses. One is that the circulation of Swiss people uh, is much more complex, much more diverse, much more intense than we could think. The second point uh, is that 
um, there is something specific to Switzerland and to Protestant culture. And we do believe that there is a very, very specific Protestant uh, vibe of pedagogy going on in that uh, context. And the last point uh, we would like to emphasize is that the process of commodification is huge. And really a lot of what we are going to show to you today is connected to market, to business, and to money. So these are, this is the pitch, these are the hypotheses, and now I will show you some of our objects for the show and how we would like to put them in perspective. So as I said, Switzerland is a country that has the reputation or the image to be quite removed, quite isolated, isolated, and um, a little bit somehow backward or preserved, to put it uh, nicely. And this is due to the fact, among other things, that Switzerland has indeed no maritime borders, no connection to the sea, no real official colonial empire. So it's a very specific country in that sense um, that has this reputation. And yet, um, of course, the more we are digging and the more we are creating uh, knowledge around that question, we make clear that there is a very strong uh, connection between Switzerland and the rest of the world, of course, already in the 18th century. And I just choose that picture for you today because um, funnily enough, or, um, it's a view of New York, very, very early one, so early 17th, 18th century, sorry, taken or designed by uh, Christoph von Grafenrin, who's a, who's a Bernese fellow and who traveled abroad um, in, in particular to, to the United States. So what we would like to do in the show, and we use this word exotic with a lot of cautious um, coma or like um, sign, and is not to reaffirm that anything is exotic per se, but much rather to try to see what's going on in that processes and what we call exoticizing, that is the fact to construct something as exotic, not to take it as it for uh, something exotic per se, but really to observe, this is, this is really our focus, to observe the processes, the fabrication, and to deconstruct uh, these processes in the making of it, in order to underline the geopolitical uh, charge, the geopolitical context that is connected in that stories and uh, objects. This is the place where the show will take place. Uh, it's a particular place in Switzerland, in Lausanne. It's important for us because actually the palace that you see here, we call it uh, Le Palais de Rumin, is uh, a very early 20th century palace, but originally on the same location happened to be one of the oldest Swiss um, collections, Swiss cabinets founded in the 16th century. So even if the palace is not the original place of that cabinet, because as I said, it's a later place, it's the site that remains. And somehow for us, there is a continuity in the site and the objects that we will show. Interestingly enough, our show takes place in the Beaux-Arts um, part of the, of the palace. And here you have it on your right. There are two big rooms, uh, beautiful big rooms, and currently with a show about from actually by Ai Weiwei, so um, a big artist. And uh, you will discover quite promptly that for us the space is fantastic, but also challenging because our objects are no Ai Weiwei pieces. <laughs> they are um, unfortunately on earth um, minor or smaller um, pieces with less impact. So there is a question also for us about how do we concretely, uh, with the scenographer of course, uh, make it happen in that space. One option could be, and it, it's an option that is often taken, uh, what we call the Wunderkammer paradigm, that is to reconstruct a Wunderkammer, a cabinet de curiosité. Um, generally, it's made a little bit out of scratch, objects that were not together are put together in that kind of Renaissance display. However, this is absolutely not what we would like to do. Uh, for many reasons, one being that um, the Wunderkammer tradition doesn't belong to Switzerland. We have no kings, no queens, no real um, nobility. This is not, we argue, uh, what was going on. So the, the construction we will do ha will have very few to do uh, with the cabinet of curiosity. For, for, for like it's our intention not to, to go in that direction. 
what we would like to do and the way we would like to work is not to collect, to, to assemble objects that could have been in Switzerland and that or that look like objects that could have perhaps been in Switzerland, perhaps at the time, but whatever, we just bought it at the art market. What we would like to do is to really do the storage research and reconstruct and somehow um, unearth this material culture because it exists, but we have to say it's not known or very, very less known than other things. And for that purpose, we have Claire, among others, who is really digging uh, into storage to find the real objects. So really basing our approach on somehow historical research, um, historical like precision, if you want, and trying to reconstruct the provenance of the, of the objects. And we reconstruct this provenance through different um, ways. One of them is also just to study the objects, because uh, you can see that a little bit here with the very small note, actually Claire unearthed these um, materials that are actually tapa, and here we found that note, and then on that note we learned that the object is connected to the Cook expedition. That can be true, that can be also false, uh, but both options are great. <laughs> both options are telling, and both options we can exploit. If it's a fake narrative of provenance, then it's even they're very interesting for, for us. So basically, um, the position is to really do the historical research. It's time consuming, it's money consuming, but I think it's the way to create something that is uh, grounded. Here are the four parts, and we are showing them to you really as a first, uh, we have not shown them to anybody before. <laughs> this is the first part of the narrative and the way we would like to develop the show. So basically, I don't know if, if it will be four rooms, four moments, four chapters, whatever it would be. Uh, this is what we have for now to present to you to organize our objects. And as I said, it's ongoing. We, we are not sure. We don't know if it's going to be final, but this is where we are. First part, maybe I'll read them. First part is, we call it exotic Switzerland. Because as you might have already get from the image I showed you with the glacier, um, in the 18th century, the first movement we would like to, to enlighten is how Switzerland itself become an exotic and attractive country. And not only from the outside, but actually from the inside. The, the person you have on your right is a pastor, uh, Johann Jakob Scheutzer. He um, used to live in Zurich, and he developed an anthropology of Switzerland. And not Switzerland per se, but specifically the mountains. So he went to the Alps, he did research, he collected objects, he met people, he developed questionnaires actually, to um, produce a couple of books showing how uh, the, the, the life in Switzerland was somehow preserved and somehow uh, a sort of um, mythological <coughs> past that was preserved. So the first movement is inside of Switzerland and cause, uh, create difference between the city, basically Zurich, and uh, the countryside or the Alps. And this we know will, will last uh, quite a lot until the 19th century. A little bit later, we have this cycle of paintings made by jo Josef Reinhardt, who's a painter from Luzern, so a little uh, city in the German-speaking part, and who realized, for many reasons actually, a cycle of uh, Trachten cyclus, it's called, so a collection of clothes that were seen as typical uh, in Switzerland and had he recorded with the people and the clothes and he built a sort of cabinet that you could visit and observe um, the lo local people but also somehow the vernacular people. What's interesting, oh, what's interesting also is that, okay, just click it, yeah, click it. That's good. <laughs> 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 no, you're an expert. Uh, no, what's interesting is that it's made of cotton. I mean, the, the, the trachten are made of cotton. So in the one hand, it's the, par it's the paradigmatic Swiss material and print and design. In the other hand, of course, and that has been studied way uh, by other like Giorgio Riello, it's a very global, um, or we, we would be tempted to say local um, somehow media. That tension between local and global we find in a lot of objects that we are we're digging so far. This is, for instance, the case with this very um, Swiss Switzerland-made porcelain cup where you were supposed to drink perhaps tea or coffee, and this is made of porcelain, so a very also uh, a material that it's well known as well in the 18th century, has a long history and a very um, transnational history, and yet the iconography that you will have on it, uh, Art, Art and Cyclus, are local um, 
um, people. And that was definitely made for internal use, but also for export as tourist souvenir. So it's the end of the, 19th, uh, this the 18th century, but you really have this moment of ma making somehow fashioning it for export. Um, and just as a matter to remind you, I think you, you, you might have um, read that before, Switzerland became really a self-exoticizing country uh, made for export. And we know, for instance, that in Versailles, Marie Antoinette wanted Swiss coast. So there was, th th there was also a business movement, but that was controlled and produced uh, inside of Switzerland. And it really became that reservoir of vernacularity. The second part, I'll show you briefly the images, is there's another part of the story because Swiss people were not only backward, uh, trachten dressed lo local people. They were also military explorers, um, uh, miners. Uh, a lot of um, had a lot of interaction actually with the outside world. And in that kind of section, we would like to emphasize that aspect, and we um, put light on objects that are less known or less seen. This is the case with François Dumoulin, who's a painter of Vevey, who. Um, used to live in the um, Caribbeans and produced a set of images that are uh, now back with him because he took them back. Here you have them in uh, Vevey. Um, for the one of you who are familiar with the 18th century art and material culture, this kind of images might ring a bell because we have other examples uh, coming not notably from Italy with Agostino Brunias of a sort of um, Caribbean landscape with race-oriented depiction of a variety of population from black slave to Creole woman and white um, uh, settlers, if you want, or white, uh, yeah, white patrons. So in, it's interesting for us to see that some, this person, although he has no training in art, somehow took place in a discourse and, or in a milieu of production that was not only his, but definitely connected to Italy, to Agostino Brunias. There is a question as well of how do we call that? Is that art? What, how do we interact with that? Is it only uh, an aesthetic practice? And how do we situate ourselves um, with that? The question is perhaps unresolved, but we, we have it like all the time because m a lot of the material we collected uh, is um, uh, at the frontier of different regime, artistic, ethnographic, travel accounts, um, and perhaps there is no way to very, def very much define what it is. Um, this, this, this drawing I'm showing you come from Fra Francis Louis Michel and who with uh, Christophe von Grafenried, the guy I showed you uh, earlier with the New York View, they did, uh, Michel did two travels to the United States, one to Virginia and the second to North Carolina where he founded New Bern, uh, the city that still exists. Um, and during the two travels, he took a lot of notes about the inhabitants he met, including uh, the Native Americans. Uh, here we have um, one of his drawing, and um, we one has to say that the authenticity of that, that drawing might still be need to, to be explored a little bit further because there are things that are very bizarre. Uh, for instance, the fact that the drawing we have from him are quite different. So we are not uh, sure yet how much is and is in each of them. But in any case, it's really interesting and first first hand and quite early actually uh, record of this interaction with native people, even more so because um, if I'm if I'm correct, and Claire will correct me if I'm not, but uh, he, he and his uh, companion, I think f f first and foremost, his companion have been kidnapped um, by by native people and have spent one year with them uh, in captivity, and then they have been re released and forced or very strongly invited to go back to Switzerland, <laughs> uh, which they did, uh, which they did. And it's for us very interesting also to, to put emphasis on that failure thing. It's very much not a history of success that we are telling, and definitely failure is part of that, and failure is, is, is due to a lot of things, including a native agency that is uh, resisting to, to invasion. The story of New Bern is goes after very long because actually the city still exists and the, the, the Dutch took it over and made, made a much better job. Um, among the people uh, we, we, we want to um, somehow explore, because then we have to s also construct the show around figures, uh, is the figure of uh, Antoine Louis Pollier, that some of you may know because he has a long history. Yeah, maybe I'm sure you do. Um, went to, he come from Lausanne, the place where we do the show. He went to India, he had like wifes, uh, was a patron of the arts. 
uh, was also a military per se, and that's what we are discovering now more and more thanks to Claire's work actually. He collected objects and he brought them back in Geneva, so uh, in Lausanne. So we find in Lausanne um, the, the, the object that Pollier uh, collected himself. We also know that he was supporting local artists and that he had a very, um, or at least that's the way we, we, we phrase it for now, he had a, a strong impact on the local um, art market. And in the other, the other way around, all this travel and all this circulation has a local, has an impact on our European, to put it like that, art market and arts production. And I just want to show you one example, but this is a drawing of John Weber, who's a Bernese uh, painter, who's well known because he traveled with Cook, uh, which also might explain why we are trying to find, or why we are finding actually Cook objects in Switzerland, because John Weber traveled and collected on the field. And he did also drawing, this is a traditional house in Alaska. And he, when he came back, and very, very soon after he came back, 1785, his drawings were made to do a theater, um, theater uh, stage design. I don't know what's the correct English term. So you set, set. Well, here you go. So interestingly enough, you have this scientific, also kind of strong colonial oriented um, expedition of Cook with Weber. But then when he came back, his drawings uh, were also used really for total um, fiction and theater play and really taken, observed and reproduced in, in fictional words. So we have this tension all the time. And last example for the second part, but there is also a very, very strong production of Romain Saint Crusoe history. Even, um, even the, the Swiss version of Romain Saint, where you, where you can see a little bit, and interestingly enough, the, the Swiss version of Romain Saint is also, is, no, the no normal version, <laughs> if you want, is the, of Romain Saint is illustrated by Dumoulin, the same guy who went to the Caribbean. So here you really see the entanglement, and that's the way we would like to put it for the second part, the entanglement between artistic practices, scientific expedition, and colonial uh, slash market slash military uh, enterprises, and how all, all that all go together with no clear, honestly, no clear uh, distinction between all the regime. Third part uh, is about the cabinet story I told you earlier, and we are trying to, to understand how, um, what was a cabinet in Switzerland. It's not easy to do because we lack of sources. Here we have one of the rare drawings that we have that showing uh, that cabinets, it's, it's in Bern. Um, this is a part we are very excited about, but we have not um, come really to a conclusion yet. Um, just to describe a little bit what we're seeing, except um, the, the group of, um, let's say, middle-aged men in the center, uh, what you have is our books, basically, uh, scientific instruments, um, and as we will emphasize, also ethnographic, or what we would call today, ethnographic pieces, non-Western pieces, and, um, and natural history specimen. And here you, just, just to give you some clue or what we are trying to, to see, this is not the image that will explain it to you at the best because the archive might do even better, but what is it? It's mostly a, a study cabinet and the idea is not really to, to um, it's not only a, a, like contemplation or fun, but definitely study and it's even more so in Lausanne where we know that the, um, they had students. Just a brief look at some of the objects that we are trying to retrace. Um, the globes that are uh, beautiful and that you have in, in Lausanne. Books, interestingly enough, um, this is a book, it, this is a manuscript obviously written by Alexandre César Chavan, who's the curator, if you want, of the cabinet in Lausanne. And in, he wrote his uh, book called Anthropology. It's, it's the very end of the 18th century. It's one of the rare occasions that in French the word anthropology is uh, used in the way it still is today. So in it's very, very uh, curious and interesting to see that it's in Lausanne, who would have thought um, that this word is used in French uh, in the sense that we still have today. For the specialist of the history of anthropology, Chavannes is still a reference. Then the book is very, very long, very, very complex, but that for us was one of the first moments where we thought, okay, there is really something special there, and there is something that, that, is, that is way beyond what we, we could have thought. 
uh, objects, as I said, non-Western objects. That's a beautiful object brought back, brought back by Cook, uh, by Cook, by John Weber, always the same artist. Uh, and he received it as a diplomatic gift during the Cook uh, expedition. Uh, it's a stunning piece, it's, it's a masterpiece for, for sure. And interestingly enough, and we are not quite sure what to do with that, and if you guys have clues, we are uh, most grateful, but we, we know that that part, that part on the top, has been added to the outfit. So basically, be at the first, you had the, the helmet and helmet and the cape, and that part has, is an addition, that is a later addition. We don't know if it's John Weber who added it, who asked for that, or if it's a offer from the people who give it that, that gift, why is the, what is the purpose, is the question of what's, what's, what's in, in there, we don't know. But what's interesting is that we not only have the piece, but we can also just like think about how the piece was changed and transformed and manipulated to try to make sense. Uh, as I said, objects have clues. Uh, we need to e explore them. Natural history is also a big part. You might not be surprised if you are familiar with the 18th century and Rousseau and all the botanic um, craziness in the Enlightenment. I just sh choose that object because it, it's important for us at multiple uh, layers. One is that um, the history of this herbier is connected to New Spain, uh, so co like colonial Mexico, basically. Um, Pyramus de Candel received an herbier from New Spain and had like one night to make it copied. Uh, he didn't know how to do, he had to give it back. He had like super, super short time. So he was in Geneva and he asked all the female artists, and this is where you, you discover that there are a lot, like. 104 female artists, if they could try to copy the RV in one night. And he said, of course, you can't do it all, so you just choose what Linnaeus wants, the pistil, the plants, the thing, and you go, and you go, and you go. And then we have this copy in Geneva that is drawn. It's no real plants, uh, but that has been drawn in why not by, by, this, by this dam of Geneva, so now it's familiarly called L'Arpied des Dames de Genève. So it's interesting because it's colonial power, it's um, Low-key artist, I would like to say. It's also, there is also, an, of course, a gender, gender story, and it crosses discipline, uh, natural history, drawing, and uh, politic. Uh, many pieces are like that, but the problem of some of them is that their, their beauty is not um, key, uh, I would say. Um, this, is the, this is the case of the gymnotus we found. It, that's also an amazing piece, although it doesn't show, perhaps. Um, because it has been collected in the 18th century by a Geneva person named Ami Butini, who used to live in Suriname, where he had a plantation, a slaved, um, slaved um, populated, so to speak, because he was producing rum, so the, the alcohol. And uh, he was also collecting specimen that then he sent to Geneva for their cabinet to have, to have them. So we know he collected this gymnet, and we know he put it in the rum he was producing. So there is a kind of very compact history that you have here, and send it to Geneva. So again, if you unfold the, the here we unfold the fish, but uh, if you unfold the object somehow, you, you, you have all these layers that we would like to, to experiment and that we found as powerful, and yet difficult somehow to, to, to exhibit for obvious reasons. Um, and oop, pardon, we just went to the, here you have the picture where we went because it's yet uh, now at the Natural History Museum and we say, we want to see the fish. And they go, oh, okay, sure, we take it. And we're like, oh no, but this is an 18th century artifact. Well, no, it's a fish, don't worry, it's just like a specimen, <laughs> we don't care. So it's so interesting, uh, we, we do interesting um, exchange with, uh, with our, our colleagues on that, on that uh, story. Um, so as I said, just in order to conclude, there are specific people we would like to highlight, Chavan, Ami Butini, specific objects that are key for us, but there is also specific challenges for, for us. We are very aware of that because of the nature of the piece and their um, difference. Simply that, it's really big, small, broken, half done. So there is a sort of fragility also in the objects that we will need to deal uh, with. And ultimately, what we would like to understand, and we are not quite there yet, is how much, uh, what is very specific to this Protestant pedagogy, except to the fact that we know that people were manipulating the things, still they are. Uh, you, you, you could touch the feather clock, you could, you could have physical interaction, but we would be very curious to know more about the ultimate um, ambition of that, of that pedagogy. Uh, and for the first part, um, 
we are uh, exploring um, what we call commodification. So it's perhaps a, a big uh, of a strong word, but here we would like to see how these travels and um, what they produce, the images that produce, the object that were brought back, but also simply the images that were produced in that context, um, what what were they meant for, and what which impact do they have? Here is very canonical uh, painter Jean Etienne Lyotard that I, I'm sure you are all. Uh, very familiar uh, with, and we know how much uh, he traveled and how much also he brand himself in that uh, particular circulation to um, Turkey and, uh, and the East. Um, and here uh, on the right, we also know that Lyota had a very strong interest for decorative arts, but we can also tell now that the decorative art had a strong interest for Lyota as well, because we know that there were a circulation and production of porcelain of Lyotard uh, to be sold on, on the market. So you have the, this moment of um, commodification also of the, of the person and of the identity somehow. Um, just more objects, it's not super visible, but we have also in Switzerland a production, not made in Switzerland, actually made in France, of um, scientific object with imitation of Asiatic lacquer. Uh, named the Verni Martin. So we know that Horace Benedict de Saussure, and at the end you'll see that it's always a little bit the same name that come back. Uh, they had mi their microscope decorated by Nollet in the 18th century with um, china looking uh, varnish, to, to say the less. The piece is in poor shape. That's one of our problems, too. Um, it goes, of course, uh, also beyond um, the limit of what we today would consider as acceptable, and we just took two examples, we have more of them. Uh, one is a pendule neck, called, that's the terminology, the French terminology. The, the pendule, the, cl the clocks making, it, uh, of course, has a very strong connection to Switzerland, and these kind of objects were made probably in Switzerland, and of course very much also in France. We know these objects quite well. If you look at, uh, at the photo the itself, you see that it's in storage, we are not on the exhibition. Uh, place, so that these are also objects that are not uh, exhibited for obvious reason of um, uh, basically transmitting racist um, voila, uh, f features. But the history of these pieces are, is not so simple as one might think, and we are trying to dig a little bit more and to see how much it could also have been connected with anti-slavery uh, um, agenda. And on the right, um, it's a porcelain piece representing a slave market. Um, I would be also very curious to hear you about that piece because we are also a bit puzzled by it. Uh, and by the way, we will exhibit it, to be honest. How should it be and how, um, how, yeah, how, um, how should it be mediated and how should we, could we actually un understand it? What is really interesting is both pieces are um, manufactured goods in Switzerland for the Swiss market, most likely representing direct slavery allusion, or even not allusion, actually, depiction. One thing that is a little hidden and that is important to us is that bag. And actually, that bag, one can guess, we have, we don't know, but one can guess uh, that it's full of uh, textile and cotton uh, clothes, because as some of you know, and this is really the work of Chonya, but the production of cotton textile was used among other things, really among other things, is what is used for everything, but among other things, as a, as a material to trade uh, slaves. So cotton, textile, and people were exchanged. And many actually of this cotton textile due to uh, a ban that happened in France were produced everywhere, but notably also in Switzerland. We have um, some of them. These are patterns um, that we found in a book that is uh, in Nantes, so it's not Switzerland, but the people who are the designers and the fabric, the Favre Petit Pierre, are Swiss uh, Indianer, we call them, and they produce this book specifically for slave trade. So it's a very important first and beautiful in a way and complicated and horrible uh, set of patterns. Here you can see uh, the depiction of an African sovereign, and here we have much more geometrical, abstract um, patterns, and here a uh, sort of Christianized, Africanized version. Um, so we have um, some turquery, we have some chinoiserie, we have what has been called also by Anne Lafont, Africanerie, and something that is really intriguing to us is how much 
um, the pattern was designed with the African client in mind because this textile were also brought to Africa to be exchanged. And one of the person in that triangular trade uh, were uh, African sovereigns, so the design were made for them. And we know they were expensive and <laughs> um, exigent, like difficult customers. They wanted specific things. Uh, so the Swiss designer had to somehow think, oh my God, oh my God, what do, what will they how do they please, how could we please them to have more people? So you have, uh, I say that in a, in a light way, of course the, the political charge is dramatic. But in the design, we, we, can, we would like to think about how this was designed for the African market and somehow taught with the Afri African clients. Uh, and that is another layer of Africanry, in, in a sense that Africanry is not only representing an African on the side of a clock, but it's also designing patterns, uh, we, we suggest, for the, for the African market. Uh, so just basically to conclude, what are we trying to do? One thing is, perhaps the first thing is to say another history of Switzerland. It's not only a close country, it's not only a little country with no colonial empire, it's a complex reality. Um, made of exchanges, circulation, including military, uh, trade, uh, powers. So this is one thing, re-inscribing or re redoing the history of Switzerland through material culture. Uh, the other thing that we would like to do, it, that's maybe more art historical prospect somehow, is really to go quite far, perhaps too far, in this art and law uh, mixing, because um, we do believe that it's interesting to juxtapose Lyotard and uh, Michel, for instance. It doesn't matter. You just should call. Yeah. Yeah. Red cross. Me neither. Yeah. So re -scribe, re re doing their history, or partly challenging the narrative of its history, partly also experimenting the connection between decorative art and high art, um, because we do, but the more we see the circulation of decorative object, the more we see how it impacted theater, painting, uh, textile, so how it is circulated. And also perhaps the last, and perhaps the most, uh, the broader point is also to, to um, inscribe our perspective modestly but firmly uh, in, a, in the perspective of decolonization uh, of the museum because many of the objects we're showing have never been shown. O o many of them have never been studied. Many of them have never been photographed, never even, men even seen because they are in storage. Uh, uh, so already bringing, back, bringing them back and bringing them for their complexity, not because they look like something else or not because they could be an example of, but because their provenance, their history tells something this is for us a way to at least acknowledge uh, the provenance and the history of the object in order to perhaps um, think a little bit more calmly also, more uh, professionally to question that are our question today, including repatriation, including uh, what is, is to do an exhibition. And we do believe that through work, through scientific study, through, stu through storage study, uh, through a serious provenance history, you can, um, be a bit more fair to the objects and also to the people uh, who made them um, circulate. So it's for 2020 and uh, <laughs> we hope we will um, go somewhere. Um, I mean, we will finish it uh, on time. <laughs> Thank you very much. What a terrific project. I'd like to congratulate all three of you on your work to date on it. And if you're going to mix Lyotard paintings and electric, pickled electric fish, yes. you've come to the right place. <laughs> and we knew. <laughs> yeah. So with that, I'd like to uh, invite questions and our, our uh, questions should go through the chair and then we'll go from there. And this is going to be questions, I think, Sonia and, and Claire, you're, Definitely. you're ready to, I'm to, done. to <laughs> answer questions <laughs> too. This can be criticism, it can be ideas who are very, uh, actually, to be honest, eager to hear from you. Yes, um, I wonder if you could go back to the Du Moulin self-portrait. Yes, absolutely. Speaking of self-exoticizing, mm -hmm. um, do we think, considering the image on the right that he painted, was he painting himself rather darker and self exoticizing himself as a, one of the people 
that he painted. Mm -hmm. I mean, because, you know, the, the visage at that <coughs> time was, you know, powder and a bit of rouge and all of it. That is, one suspects that is not the complexion mm -hmm. his mama first saw when mm he -hmm. was born. Do we think that's a self-exoticizing self touch on his part to be um, known as a chap who has visited places and of darker complected people and made a name for himself painting those people? But thank you very much. I think it's an interesting question. I, I don't know for the for the complexion. I don't think part of it might also be like the way. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the lightning of everything, the, the mm. picture, and it makes me, me maybe look it a little bit darker. But that being said, because you um, look at his hands and his face, he seems to have darkened his yeah. hands and face to be mm -hmm. seen as one who has been in the non-European world. I mean, in, like Lyotta, uh, he was marketing himself like that. Um, I would say perhaps it's not very visible, but the matter of culture of the portrait would be. He has a five, his cat, I'm not an expert, but I, I think his name is Calico Cat. Mm -hmm. So there is also kind of a connotation with um, textile trade, and he definitely made himself uh, known as one of the artists who traveled abroad. Um, it was not a good strategy for him, and it didn't work well, I have to admit. <laughs> he died in very poor, um, poor state. But there is definitely something in his self portrait that is uh, absolutely trying to somehow brand him, I think, as a traveler. Uh, yeah, and he's, you know, he's an expert of boats, and he has a really, like, he's a fascinating person. You want and, to? and it is interesting, because when he came back, he really tried to bridge that gap towards the fine arts. So he did training in France, and he really wanted to become a and do we know the artist? Do we know if he marketed to use a 20th century marketed himself as an exotic, touched by exotic? You know what? He reproduced. He was in the in the spirit of paradise. He paid more. What Gauguin would do years later? Yeah, I don't know if I. There is a piece of yeah paradise he copied. If yeah, don't have it with us. No, but it's interesting because there's the foreign paradise, but at the same time, Dumoulin painted pastoral scenes when he came back. So he really worked on both. Uh, worked both ends. Uh -huh. Both ends, yes. So it was this Swiss paradise and the other paradise, both uh, an invention based on some reality, but seen okay. through this. Andrew. Yes, fine. Thank you very much for such an interesting talk. Um, I'd like to sort of ask you more about the Protestant angle. Um, and, and then in that regard, um, thinking about cabinets, um, I know in Zurich, for instance, the public library there had a kind of Kunstkammer, I'm sure you know all about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Antistas, the sort of head of the, of the Swiss church, so the Calvinist church, actually censored various objects within the collection. Oh, yeah. So there's a very interesting sort of connection there about, uh -huh. about what is allowable for the, and it was a public library, it was open uh -huh. to the entire, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, all the citizenry. So I just wondered um, where you see the Protestant angle, as it were, uh -huh. informing the notions of collecting. Protestant angle, no? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, because she knows more than me. Um, it's hard to do. But it's a, it's, a, it's a question we're really trying to, to uh, answer. Um, it's hard to do generality, and I, th I also am aware that a cabinet of curiosity could have been very, very, very different things. Uh, what we know, for instance, for Chavan, is that um, he, the collection he had was dedicated to study. Very few was visible. Almost nothing was really visible and exhibited, definitely not. The book were visible, but not really the objects. And they had lessons. Uh, and sometimes we know that because sometimes we know in the archive he said, "Oh, but this is not good for uh, for uh, the students." So, <laughs> so we know that. But I don't know if it was censorship or simply other other um, paradigm. Actually, um, all the major actors of the story we are telling are pastors. All are Protestant, yeah. active, uh, key clergy clergymen, definitely. So this is really on. Um, Undeniable, I think. 
but this is what I'm trying to understand, and I'm not sure how is what were what was the well, there, are, there were m multiple cities, multiple languages. Suzanne has never been a, a compact territory. So religion was what made uh, them stick together somehow. But in Lausanne, they speak French. And like, sure. So it's very diff difficult to have like one simple uh, goal for all of them. But uh, we, we are trying to understand what was the, the pedagogical uh, aim and what was the pedagogical uh, narrative somehow. And it's hard to tell because we don't know what this guy were exactly. Because I, I, I was, I was doing a little bit of work on artistic censorship in the 17th century, yeah. um, and their artists and printmakers, yeah. and indeed people producing texts, everything mm -hmm. had to go through a censor board. Mm -hmm. And then I came across this interesting mm -hmm. reference: the fact that objects too mm -hmm. were subject to censorship. So mm -hmm. it's the, it's a kind of broader censorship of of, um, of knowledge. In mm -hmm. sense. So not just aesthetic and artistic. Yeah, if yeah. I, it's, there is something that is, the, the, the common narrative about that book, that book has no image. Uh, it's anthropology, it's a study of man, uh, in its, its context, his context, there is no image. It's only text, it's very long, it's very difficult. So what, what, one of the, of the um, points that generally people make is to say, oh, he's a Protestant, he has no interest for image, well, you know <laughs> how the guys are. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, but the more we are digging, the more we think that he actually had uh, objects, probably, most likely. So it's not <coughs> this simple, um, sure. this simple Protestant aesthetic. Although, for sure, there is no engraving in that uh, project, uh, as far as we, as we know. So there is, a, there is a certain rejection, and it's known for that rejection. Um, but yet, the archives and the, and the storage tells that actually it was a bit more balanced. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it's great to see these images, and, and much of what you're talking about speaks to me in, in different ways. But I had a question about the challenges of finding the sources of these provenances. Mm -hmm. um, and if you could say more, I mean, you saw the, the note, the Captain Cook note, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. you acknowledge may be mm -hmm. a way of elevating your object, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious what other sorts of sources you have mm -hmm. um, that you found, and also how you anticipate working sort of methodologically between these potential fantasies or, you know, mm -hmm. dressing up of the object's histories mm -hmm. and what you can know. I mean, I was struck by the sort of fact fiction dialogue that you're seeing mm -hmm. in the objects themselves. So how you anticipate in an exhibition context, mm -hmm. you know, how do you get at provenance of these things? What are some of your tools? Mm -hmm. um, we try to find, uh, for the Cook collection, we know that Weber who lived in uh, London, gave his collection to Bern because his father was a Bernish uh, inhabitant. And probably um, Cook collection arrived in uh, Switzerland like that. And probably also um, the, the tapa was cutting from another mm -hmm. more bigger. So after we try to reconnect also pieces um, from other. From other. Mm -hmm. But also we have written sources, mm -hmm. and then we have the objects, mm -hmm. and it rarely matches. And uh, so, but we, it's not, sometimes it does match. Uh, Claire found a, an object we know was uh, was reproduced somewhere, and then we found the object. So this is, but this is really, really very mm -hmm. uh, uh, rare case. Mm -hmm. So we are we are really trying to. Um, yeah, construct on what we have. It's very few evidences, but we it's still there, it's still there. Um, but more in the archives, in objects, and sometimes we see there are some objects have been reproduced, and then we can really compare. That's kind of uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. to, to the image. Well, we have an image of the, but not here. I don't think so. We've been, but it's super difficult, and uh, and I mean, we might not be hundred percent certain of. Uh, Things um, and we're trying to go where we know more. Actually, yeah. Uh, do you have any clues? <laughs> Maybe you no. Know, I mean, <laughs> I'm thinking about this a lot myself. Yeah. These lost histories and how far we can. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like you, I'm. I fear the sort of um, 
overly um, didactic path, I guess, mm -hmm. and willing to explore, mm -hmm. but I don't know at what point you decide it's sort of a lost thread, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and if, then you give up on it. Mm -hmm. Perhaps the 18th century is a bit later than the new period, yeah. so it's a bit easier some, somehow. But uh, après, the advantage of Switzerland is more, uh, it's not Paris, it's not like, you know, uh, I don't know, Florence. It's not like we have hundred millions of, uh, yeah, neither object, neither source, neither, so you can, you can more or less connect uh, it more or less. Mm -hmm. oh. No, no, okay. uh, I noticed that um, the objects in the core circles are not really um, included. I was thinking maybe like the portrait of Le Fort, but probably earlier than the period. Um, yeah. There's a Russian textiles and Chinese textiles in the portrait, and also like um, a Tomata sent to Chinese work. And uh, yeah. these objects in the core circles um, are not really included in your project, so yeah. I wonder if this is a choice or not. Yeah, I think. Um, does anybody else want to answer? Or? The thing is that, well, uh, I just thought maybe we would have. Ah, well, we have that. Yeah, um, so we have a lot of pieces made for export in Switzerland. Uh, it's one of the big things uh, to Istanbul and also to China, clocks, Ottoman. This is really one of the big, big, big things. And we really wish and hope. Because it's fascinating. Because it's a bit like the Indian de Trait, right? Mm -hmm. So what designing for the other, uh, trying to design for the other, what they would like to do with the Swiss expertise, but yet another kind of um, iconography. Uh, and we have it's quite well known. There are there are places in, in few in, in the couple of uh, evidence. We would like to include them. Um, one of the difficulty of that part is perhaps that many of them are not into sun anymore. It means going. Then they are far away. So the question is a little bit also how do we concretely uh, explore that part when we don't have any or very few objects. But definitely it's part of, of the list. And we have like multiple. It's very precious objects, very beautiful objects, um, and generally sent away uh, pieces. But yes, it's a big part of the, of the, of the story. So absolutely. Thank you very much for um, telling us about this fantastic project. I look forward to the exhibition. Um, my question is uh, about, um, you mentioned that uh, most of these objects have never been uh, exhibited, <coughs> displayed. Um, uh, why do you think is the reason <laughs> until now? Uh, is there resistance, is there, is there a sort of contemporary current resistance to uh, exoticism? Or there's a longer tradition, uh, and also um, artists like um, Lyotard. Uh, has he been exhibited? Uh, has he received any? Uh, yes, yeah. there was a there was a big exhibition not long ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, how was the response to, I guess, Lyotard's exoticism then? Yeah. And what kind of response are you expecting? Uh, from uh, the public, mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if you mm -hmm. are factoring in to uh -huh. um, There are multiple ways to answer, I guess, this question. Um, one simple way would be to say, well, the provenance has not been done, many of the objects have not been simply seen, or really something to the attention of Claire while she was sort of like looking for something else. But there is that uh, dimension, for sure. Um, Perhaps another dimension is um, to say that the histories that are beyond the objects are not always um, simple and not always um, um, sweet. <laughs> they are generally also quite um, connected to a lot of brutality in that part. I think um, Switzerland ha has worked. I mean Switzerland. Many scholars in Switzerland have worked on the on the history of. Um, the connection between between Switzerland and slavery, for instance, but we, we cannot say that it's the favorite topic <laughs> in every museum. It's, it's, it's still a, a, um, very important, but a bit marginalized uh, perspective. In <laughs> uh, Lieta, I think what for me is exciting is to put Lieta in a context, because there is this tendency to see Lieta as an incredible guy who traveled and loved Chinese art, and, and it's all true. Uh, and yet, when you observe it from Geneva, what was there, what he saw, who were the others, then it takes another 
quality. Um, not saying that is not exceptional. I mean, I think if we want to speak like art historian, the quality of his work is beyond uh, most of the things that we have shown. But his trajectory is very, very rooted to a context that is connected also to also, uh, and, and also to Dumoulin and certainly other people. So we, we, we somehow, the, I think the show is interesting for Lyotta because it puts him uh, in a more uh, realistic context. And no, he's not this exceptional man. Of well, he's definitely, but uh, if you look at who were the others, what he was able to see in Geneva, then you understand, ah, okay, then there is a context for that, too. Um, there is a little political um, uh, challenge, I think, also to tell these histories and also to tell them, not for the 19th and 20th century that are perhaps more known, but then earlier as well. It's a bit uh, different. The early modern period is less um, studied. Um, also, to get to the objects is sometimes a challenge. For instance, we get an email reply by someone saying, well, Exotic is not in our database. We don't have an exotic object. So sometimes you really, it, it needs mediation and it needs a lot of work to get to this. I think you will invent that category to yeah. force, etc. And also for, to work in the 18th century is a challenge in that regard because the 19th century is much more worked on. I'd like to ask, use Chair's privilege to ask a question about uh, procedure uh, with uh, and, and the extent to which you may have consulted with scholars in originating communities. Uh, I'm thinking of things like the Hawaii and Feather Cloak uh, mm -hmm. and how, uh, in, how now best practice basically mandates that. And I've wondered to what extent you've had the opportunity to do that. This may not be something that is uh, normally done in museums in Switzerland? I simply don't know. I think it's a great question. We're very, very much thinking about it. We have considered all the position. Uh, first, we said we need that, and we want, um, I don't know, an artist to really get <coughs> it. And then we said, oh, but the show is not about that. The show is about Switzerland. We are not working on this object per se. We're working about that in a discord. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, all the position you can take, basically. Um, it's best practice to do it in Switzerland, as everywhere, I think. Uh, the Ethnographic Museum in Geneva just invite um, uh, Thomas uh, to restage uh, things. Um, and um, we are considering it. I don't know how we will handle that. Would you, yeah. What would you advise? Well, I'm thinking particularly of the, of the puzzle you have with the cloak that was brought back by, by uh, John Weber right. uh, and the puzzle you presented us there. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that there may well be, and we have chased this up already, there may well be folks at the Bishop Museum mm -hmm. in Honolulu uh, who, are, uh, who are native scholars who might be able to help with this. And, but if I can take your question one step further, do you think because we're also aware that we're touching sensitive topic. Again, yeah. we really do the history of Switzerland. We position ourselves as that. Nevertheless, the history is broader, and the objects are also collected in the um, context of violence and domination. So that has to be acknowledged. And we are wondering, but it's an open question: how much we 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 should um, uh, yeah integrate native perspective on that? Would it make sense? We 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 had like really serious and very honest discussion about what should be done. Mm -hmm. You think we should? Yes, we think. Yes, I, 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 <laughs> yes. <laughs> but even just from a practical point yeah. of view, you might get some very useful answers. Uh -huh. And from well. a comparative point of view, they may have drawings or other examples from the time to help you figure out exactly what it looked like originally. Of course, so far we have asked the creators of the museum, but they actually are not entirely sure of the reason. Mm -hmm. And it's time for one last question. Um, I'm interested in where the ideas came from for this exhibit. Um, and it's interesting to me that this is such a research-driven project um, that could equally be well-suited for a written piece, um, a solely a written piece. And so I wondered how working uh, in a, on, a, on an exhibition and thinking about presenting material objects to a public um, 
might shape your research questions a little differently than had you been preparing this kind of topic uh -huh. for a book. It's uh -huh. a good question. Um, <laughs> one thing is that we are working collectively, and each of us is trying also to publish on that separately. So there is a written activity, but the, the, the collective activity, and there is some person missing, I should say her name, Sarah Petrella. Um, it, so that's really the moment where we come together. Mm -hmm. um, the aim, honestly, is to have a bit of, um, I don't know if visibility is the right word, but uh, I think uh, we are very much aware that this place where I will exhibit there are public. It's a free museum, I have to say, it's open to everybody. It's really, there's free Wi-Fi. Uh, it's really, <laughs> but it's very crowded. It's interestingly very much visited, maybe not for our, specifically for our show, but in general. Mm -hmm. So I think we really do are eager to have this visibility and to open this discussion uh, also in Switzerland with this culture. Magical culture. Um, it's founded by a Swiss institution, so it's supported by the state, basically. So it's also it's like they want us to uh, do that research. Um, I think separately we would not cross so much. Shonya is working more on textile. Um, I'm interested in lacquer. Claire is doing um, more the Pacific objects in collection because this is her field. So what is really uh, interesting and challenging is the fact that we came with the different expertise and we mixed the objects. And it's also the challenge, I think. Good, well, it's, I think it's very clear that what we have here is an exhibition in the making that yeah. has a very strong research yeah. agenda. And it's, I would put it to, to, to put it out there that no exhibition, that, that uh, an exhibition that fails to have a strong re, uh, research agenda is going to be a failed exhibition. And we see this again and again, even within walking distance of this place. Uh, <laughs> mention any names. However, I think this is going to be a really strong uh, exhibition from what we've seen. And I'd like to thank our three, three presenters here, uh, Noemi and Claire and Shana, for presenting this amazing project. Thank, thank you. you so much.